David Hu, you talk about this being the age of a major shift. Right. What kind of shift are we in, and why is this a different shift than any other time? Well, I call it the shift age, and my conceptual ancestors were Alvin Toffler and Marshall McLuhan. So when you read Toffler, he talked about the three ages, the agricultural age, the industrial age, and the information age. So early in this century, like 04, 05, I started to sense that something new was going to happen. So I went back and I read all those old greats. When they wrote in the 60s and 70s, so they kind of diffuse in their image, in their sense of this century. And so then I really started to look around. And I started my blog, Evolution Shift, in 2006. And I just got a sense that we were in a huge state of shift. So I called it the shift age. So what the shift age is in its simplest form, it's the global stage of human evolution. Stop. You speak as though this is the beginning of the 21st century, whereas technically it began in the year 2000 or 2001. Why do you pin it here? Great question. Um, I have this phrase called legacy thinking. So if you think about it, and you really think about it, here we are towards the end of 2012, and uh, we, America, we, the Western world, the developed countries certainly, and certainly the politicians have kind of powered into the 21st century with the legacy thinking of the 20th. And you see that, well, let's go back and try the way Ronald Reagan did it or LBJ did it, and you can't because they were presidents, there wasn't, there was a cold war, there wasn't the internet, there wasn't climate change, there wasn't a global economy. So legacy thinking has powered us into where we are, 2012. And this is the first decade of 21st century thought. And, and what I say to audiences when I talk is I say, think about the phrase 20th century, right? 20th century. American century, century of science, century of World War. It all began from 1914 to 1918. World War I, uh, general theory of relativity, 1916. Uh, Russian Revolution, 1917, 1918, map of Europe was set, map of the Middle East was set. So as we look back over 100 years, the, all the storylines of the 20th century really began in that second decade. If you think back in the first decade, it was Victorian England, the United States, 46 states, bucolic, isolationist country. So it all changed. So I think future historians can look back and say, this is when humanity started thinking 21st century thought. You're a futurist. You talk to business. You're talking at this conference to coaches. What message should we be taking away from what you're saying, especially in your new book, which you will Well, mention? there's a lot of messages. And uh, what I try to do, I define what I do as a futurist as being a catalyst to get people, the market, and the world to think about the future and then to facilitate a conversation about it. So I always ask, as, I will, as I've asked here to, you know, today, to lift people up out of their present, out of their profession, out of their relationships, and let me take them on a journey into the future. Because most people look at the life, their lives, and the future of their business, or CEOs look at the future inside out, through the eyes of being a CEO, through the eyes of being a coach and their clients. And what I try to say is there's forces that are going on outside in that will affect you as much as your inside out view of the future is concerned. So I really try and lift people out of the present context because it's impossible to see the future if you're stuck in the present. And because most people um, with that legacy thinking think they're present, but they're really thinking thoughts from the past. I always ask people to say, so think of the three or four thoughts that define your worldview. When did you first think them? You know, you and I are of a certain age, so we had spent a lot of our life in the 20th century. So we had a lot of our thinking formed in the 20th century. So to be able to see the future, you've got to be able to go back, okay, maybe what my best friend told me in 1990, what my dad told me in 1970, or this great book I read in 1995, I had to revisit because the world has changed. So I really try to get people to get unstuck and to open themselves up. What thrills me is when people come up to me afterwards and said, I never thought of it that way. Or you've changed the way I think about parenting. Or I get an email from somebody three months later going, you know, within a month after hearing you, I've decided to do this differently, and it's been very successful. That's what thrills me. Talk about your new book. 
my new book is exciting to me, but of course I'm, I've been living in it. It's called Entering the Shift Age. I wrote a, a book in 2007 called The Shift Age. Then uh, I wrote a book called Shift Ed, a Call to Action for Transforming K-12 through Education. And then The New Health Age, The Future of Healthcare in America. And so an aside there is I speak to CEOs all around this country. And particularly when Lehman Brothers went down and you know things were really dark, I was asked the question, are we going to remain a great nation? And I found myself saying, if we don't better educate our young, if we don't become healthier, and we don't completely rebuild the energy, transportation, and communications infrastructure in this country, it doesn't matter what else we do, right? So Entering the Shift Age is my fourth book, and it really is the summation of the Shift Age and the last four to five years since I wrote it of speaking all around the world and verifying so much of what I initially wrote. So Entering the Shift Age is what the Shift Age is, it talks about, okay, so now you know what the shift age is. Part three of the book is the transformation decade. So here's how the shift age is manifesting itself as you look around, and here's the trends. And then part four is the future of the shift age, where I look at education, energy, technology, the ascendancy of women, and talk about what the future is going to be over the next 20 years. So it comes out January 1st. Uh, uh, 2013. And also, the other thing is, I stand up and I talk about transformation, change in nature, shape, character, and form. So, this comment is walking the talk. So, I went to my publisher and I said, you know, the whole publishing industry is imploding, just like the music industry did and the movie industry and everything else. We're going to do it differently. So, my book is being published like no other book has ever been published, and I think it's the model for the future. So, my book comes out in print, ebook, and enhanced ebook. I've been doing video for it in January. But between now and then, every single part of the book in 12 ebooks will be coming out as many ebooks, like 99 cents to 2.99. So, you can just buy the part of the book you want. If you think about your reading habits, and I've talked to lots of people about reading nonfiction books, nobody reads a whole nonfiction book. You know, you read the first chapter, the last chapter is redundant, whether it's good to great, the world is flat, whatever it is. So I figured, why not? If an educator just wants to read about the future of education, just pay 99 cents and read that. So I'm disintermediating the book. So entering the shift age is, of course, I'm living with it, and it's the synthesis of my thought. I mean, I'll stand on that book. So I'm excited. That takes a lot of courage to take a new form. And it brings me back to one last thing I want to get to. You mentioned in one of your presentations that cell phones have gone to an right. enormous uh, level of distribution, but some people went from zero to cell phone, that they didn't right. have landlines and all the things that we've grown up with. Do you feel that there is a level of evolution that is going on equally around the world, or are we going to find ourselves with lots of pockets of people trapped in the past because of, because of lack of access, lack of funds, lack of resources, or is there a leveling going on? I think there's a leveling going on. I mean, there, there is a serious issue in the world today about the disparity of the rich and the poor. Always has been, always will be, to some degree. I can't solve that problem. But if you think about this fact, Electricity is 125 years old. Cell phones are 30 years old. There are more people that have cell phones than have electricity because of the infrastructure of cellular. So, as you know, because you've heard one of my talks, I always say, because so we're four feet away. And if I were to call you on your cell phone, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, five seconds, your phone would ring. I call somebody in China, 12,000 miles away, maybe another two seconds because of the relay of the satellites. The difference between three feet and 12,000 miles is two seconds. So is there no time or distance limiting human communication? And then you always say, where are you at? So there's no time or distance or place limiting human communication. So that's an equalizer. I always pull out my cell phone and I say, to your point, out of the 5.6 billion people that have a cell phone, for three and a half billion of them, actually four billion of them, it's the first phone they've ever had. So think about that. It has brought economic leverage to the developing countries of the world for the first time. If you're in a small village in sub-Saharan Africa, you've always lived on the tyranny of taking your craft goods, your agricultural goods, to the next biggest town, and they'll lowball you because they know they're your only option to sell the product. Now, you'll call the three different big 
villages go, what do you pay me? What do you pay me? What do you pay me? Economic leverage. So I think it's a great equalizer. When 80%, 82% of all of humanity has a way to communicate, it's freedom. Your insight into freedom and the evolution right. process is very exhilarating for me. Tell me what you think of the cam, cam experience, the Camelot experience. Well, Camelot's a wonderful metaphor, right? Um, and as I've talked to people here, I find a great affinity with what I do. As I said, I'm a catalyst to get people to think about the future, to lift them up out of their own context. And I sense that's what some of these master coaches do. They provide a larger context. People are probably stuck in their place. They're stuck in their situation. They're stuck in their self. They're stuck in their ego. They're stuck in their relationships. And an outside person who can lift them out of that context, can make them see something, they're being stuck in that context they can't see. Just like as a futurist, I want to lift people out of their present context so that they can look in on it and come, oh, okay, I can let that go, or okay, maybe I should consider this. Or, so I find that, in a way, the dynamic is similar. I think, it's, I, I think coaches' value is to open people up to see things that they can't see. It's not like it's teaching them facts. It's allowing them to think about their situation differently, or it's allowing them to have somebody to interact with that can let them emerge. And that's what I feel I'm doing. You know, when people come up to me and they say, I've changed, you've changed the way I thought. I mean, I got to think that's what a coach hears all the time, right? So I think there's that similarity. Everyone's always talking about what's wrong with education. Right. What's your view as a futurist on education? Oh, um, thank you for asking. I'm very passionate about it. Uh, in the 21st century, we have to completely transform K through 12 education. Um, reform doesn't cut it. It has to be transformation. And again, transformation, change in nature, shape, character, and form. So we got to change all of those in education. Um, I wrote a book, Shift Ed, it came out in early uh, 2011, and I talked about many things. Ask the right questions. What's the right school year? We have a school year based on the agricultural age because this was in the 1800s, so the kids could go to spring break and plant and they'd have the summer off to harvest. So we've got an, a school year based on the agricultural age. We teach kids in buildings built in the industrial age, and we have technology that's already out of date from the information age, so we gotta reinvent. We all have heard about the three R's, reading and writing and arithmetic, and I say we need to have the five C's. Creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, content, and context. Creativity, it's the single most important quality America needs and business needs for the next 20 years. Creative thinking. Collaboration, the number one skill, right? We have to collaborate to get anything done these days. Critical thinking in an information overloaded world, the ability to think critically as to what information is important. Content, because, well, say when I grew up, you're younger than I, but when I grew up, you memorize stuff. Content was fixed, there are facts. Now it's mutable, the mashup, you know, like Google Maps. And finally, context, because the context in which an individual receives the information affects the content. You know, if you can look at a, le read a left-leaning newspaper and a right-leaning newspaper, same story, different context, right? So we need to transform. And what I find so interesting, so my book came out in spring of 2011, and I speak to statewide school superintendents all across this country. And just in that 18 months, there's a change. Uh, in the book, I referred to it as a phase transition. In other words, at 211 degrees, water is water. In 212 degrees, it's water, but it's steam. So that's a phase transition. We're going through that. Now, I think 3 to 5% of K-12 through institutions in this country are just choosing to transform themselves, forget the bureaucracy, forget the government. They're doing it. And I think by 2015, that'll be about 20%. And by the end of this decade, 2020, we'll have complete transformation in the schools. We have to, there's no alternative. And the problem is, I'm a baby boomer, I think you're a baby boomer, and so we're kind of this bridge generation from the middle part of the last century. We just gotta get out of the way, because all of the future students, the current and future students in K-12 are what I call digital natives, the first generation born into the digital landscape. 
So they are wired differently, they think differently. And to make them say, turn off their cell phones because they're in the school when all of the world's knowledge is two keystrokes away, it's ludicrous. Einstein said it best. He says, why memorize anything I can look up, right? So I think that K through 12, um, one of the, you know, we have the student-teacher ratio. I always ask the audience, tell me what your bureaucrat to, to, to teacher ratio is, right? There's too much infrastructure. It's an industrial age bureaucracy. We need to blow it up. So transformation, number one. I think uh, higher ed is, about re is the next big bubble, as we sit here in 2012. Uh, tech was the first bubble, real estate's the second, higher ed. Unsustainable loan amounts, or more than a trillion dollars of outstanding loans that the students can't pay. Uh, uh, a new global economy that is really challenging the value of spending $100,000 to go through college. Um, and a delivery system that basically, except for different lighting and some electricity, is the same as it was 400 years ago. So you've got institutions that are 400 years old in their construct that have lifted their prices at two to three times inflation for the last 40 years, that no longer are providing value, and that are not educating people to get jobs. So by definition, it's broken. And the last thing I want to say, and this is where we really have to think differently. If you think about neuroscience, how the brain works, we've learned more in the last 10 years than in all of humanity's time before that. As a, as a friend of mine said once, he said, if we could take all the information we know about the development of a brain from the date of birth to the age five and push that into the pre-K education landscape in this country, we could change this country in a generation. So it's just a matter of taking everything that is available and bringing it into an outdated, antiquated, rear view thinking, institutional construct called education in this country. That's a powerful idea. Isn't that? It really is. Yeah. Here are a couple of questions that would run across my mind. Sure. When we compare ourselves to China, for example, right. or India, we critique ourselves on the level that our students understand mathematics and mm -hmm. the way we teach mathematics. Right. How do we overcome that kind of traditional view of test taking and scoring and all those things that make us compare ourselves to China. I mean, they sit there in China and memorize things in a right. rote fashion, right. even, even older style than, than we use today. Right. Well, there's several short answers to that okay. uh, and a lot of more in-depth ones. But the short answers are, I always ask audience, is this a standardized world? No. So why do we have standardized tests, first of all? Second of all, STEM you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. That's what we did in reaction to Sputnik in 1957. I believe it's all about creativity. I don't care how many engineers we educate, it's about creativity. The 20th century was a left brain century. The 21st century is a right brain century. It is time to, to teach children how to think creatively, to take all those wonderful inventions of the 20th century, the computer, uh, telecommunications, everything, and redeploy it using creative thinking. So I don't care how much rote education goes on in India and China. The good, smart engineers in China and India want to come to the United States because that's where they can be free to think creatively. Um, one third of all Silicon Valley com companies that have successfully started were started by immigrants who came over here because they had the opportunity, because they were too hidebound. So, I don't, you know, the other thing about this global com competition, we as Americans have to accept that we're in the global stage of human evolution. So it used to be, oh, we're the United States of America, we're king of the hill. Well, now everybody's on the top of the hill to some degree. So we have to share that. So rather than trying to compete with China, we have to compete against ourselves and what we're failing to do. And so I think the United States is the engine of innovation in this world. So how do you prepare children for being innovators. Well, what's the definition of innov innovation but the implementation of creativity into the marketplace? So I'm all for creativity. That's why I am a futurist in residence at the Ringling College of Art and Design, not some tech place or engineering place, because I want to stand and say the future of the United States of America and the world at large in this century is creativity.
Let's walk you out. Okay.